Let's go. Meeting is being recorded. Continue. Share screen. There we go. That's it. And here we go with this. And let me get my pointer going here. Okay. To remind us, we are halfway through of a long, of a very long, um, long lecture, which really two lectures pulled together, uh, the last one and this one now. Um, and uh, let me just mention here at the beginning, before we get going on this, that um, when we started the course, the first few lectures were from Costa Rica. And uh, where I was sitting was in our, our as I say, dwelling uh, in the forest. And um, it was full of frogs and, and uh, mice and bats and insects and I don't know what other kinds of animals. Um, but up here in Philadelphia, we felt very uh, ignored by the animal community. But as we were sitting here preparing for this just a few minutes ago, uh, when he opened the back door and a squirrel came into the kitchen to uh, raid our uh, loaf, loaves of bread sitting on the dryer. So now we uh, feel like we are part of the animal community up here, as well as back there in Costa Rica. Uh, it's a very interesting squirrel, very brave, very, very curious, but very focused on a loaf of bread. Um, so we, we're, we're in a debate here as to whether we should encourage this by feeding him more or not, not encourage it. Anyway, um, we're here talking about things like bioalpha, bioliteracy, uh, the, the hardcore facts of bioliteracy, and the biopolitics of bioliteracy. And we'll continue here with the facts at the moment, the DNA barcoding part of this. And um, I have a note here to myself to remind you about this paper in, in genome. Uh, we have now parked in the, um, uh, in the canvas uh, folder for this lecture, a, a very long and um, uh, shall we say very scientific paper. Um, there's only one there. there the, the ones from the previous lecture are more newspaper articles, uh, which are quick and easy to read and uh, written for a um, uh, popular audience, let's say. But this one is written for uh, three distinct silos in um, Costa Rican and international, um, in, the, in the international community. Uh, one is for scientists. Uh, one is for conservationists who are focused on saving it. And a third uh, silo that's um, involved here uh, is the uh, engineering silo who does the project in the rainforest that the, the project is biomonitoring uh, using DNA barcoding. And so there's a lot of nauseating detail in there. Uh, that's not for you to memorize, but rather that's the kind of background that goes along with anybody seriously interested in the topic uh, of understanding the impact of a uh, industrial project on a piece of tropical complicated rainforest. So that paper is in there uh, for you to read. And then I would recommend that you uh, read it slowly and uh, maybe even take it in uh, two, two pieces rather than one long read. Anyway, continuing on, to remind you about this thing about the barcode is it's this one little piece of the mitochondrial genome that we all carry. And it's even a little piece of that one. This one's called CO1. And uh, it's a 650 base pair piece of that gene right there. And uh, everybody in the audience, everybody listening to me anywhere in the world has got the same piece there. And the reason why this is so immutable is that this is, deals with your oxygen metabolism. So if, you, this, if this gene gets mutated out of function, you die. So it, there's a strong, strong selection for keeping this gene to be quite, quite similar from species to species to species, but it can change a little bit. So if you take a barcode like this one that you see right here, and you um, change uh, one, one, one of the base pairs, um, there's three, the base pairs come in triplets, three at a time, 
And um, each one of those triplets uh, is a, uh, um, if you like, a, a code for a particular amino acid of the say 23 or so amino acids that we're all built out of. And um, the first two members of that triplet uh, in the in, of the three of three, of the three base pairs uh, cannot be changed. It basically, if they're changed, then the mute, that's a mutation that's lethal for this gene, and, um, and that animal dies. Uh, but in the third one, in a number of cases, can be changed, and so therefore, um, not for all base, not for all amino acids, but for some. And that allows you to change a letter here and a letter there and a letter there. So you've got 650 letters to play with. And, um, and that allows an enormous number of combinations. The outcome being that this becomes a code for the particular species. In this particular case, it's this fly up here on the upper left-hand corner. Now, um, just one a moment here. I want to get rid of these. Oh, that's all right. We'll continue on here. Now, one of the outcomes of this is that a species of animal that's had one name for a long time, in this particular case, the focal animal is this thing called a Pantales leucostigma. So it's just a little tiny wasp. Um, that's a parasite of caterpillars. So here's the caterpillar. Mom wasp, wasp came along and stuck eggs into this caterpillar, the larvae, developed inside the caterpillar, basically killed the caterpillar, and came out through these holes that you see here through the skin, or the cuticle, to put it more correctly. They then spun these cocoons. So out of these cocoons came a whole lot of little tiny wasps. They've had a name, a Pantales leucostigmus, for a hundred and some odd years. To be precise, 113 years. When we barcoded them, we just here's what the wasp looks like. These are the, these are the wasps themselves. They're about two millimeters long. When these are barcoded, they turn into 39 different species. In other words, 39 different combinations of that barcode, and each one of these turns out to be a parasite of a specific species of caterpillar in the same place. So what we have is 39 specialists instead of one who can meet. 39 different things, okay? So this, uh, this was viewed as a generalist on this group of caterpillars beforehand. Now we know it's not a generalist at all, but rather it's 39 different specialists, each one of them looking for its particular caterpillar to lay its particular eggs on and develop into something like this, killing the caterpillar, out come the cocoons, all these are the kids, and they go off looking for more caterpillars of the same species. That's the sort of thing that this kind of, of combination of molecular biology with regular old fashioned field and natural history begins to reveal. Now here's another example, just to broaden this, uh, this story for you all. Here's a fly. And if you imagine that the fly is standing on his legs and bending his abdomen underneath himself or herself, sorry, herself, to reach with her abdomen and lay an egg right there on the side of this caterpillar. So that's how she parasitizes the caterpillar. She lays an egg here, glues it on the side of the caterpillar. The little egg larva come down, the larva comes out of that egg, drills into the caterpillar, feeds on the inside of the caterpillar, eventually kills the caterpillar, and out comes and pupates and produces another fly. So that's a parasite of this caterpillar. Now. We've been rearing a large number of these in Costa Rica. And uh, you rear them by finding the caterpillars and eventually out comes the parasite if it had one. And so we have 16,000 records of these caterpillars which have been uh, potentially parasitized by a fly and actually 5% of them actually produced parasitic flies. They actually parasitized. Now, of those 5%, there were 420 species that were easy for this world specialist for these things to tell apart. So he looked at them all and he said, oh, this is different from that, this is different from that, this is different from that, the 420 species. 96% of these 420 
seem to be very specialized because each one of the species came out of a particular species of caterpillar. But there were 16 of the 420 who were generalists. They had long lists of species of caterpillars from which they emerged. But then we came along with barcoding 10 years later. And we said to Monty, who was the taxonomist here, are they really generalists? Are these 16 leaves really generalists? Or are they more things pooled together in ignorance? So this guy, Alex Smith, a Canadian, took the legs off of a very, very large number of these. And as you can see the little label here that's on the specimen, legs away for DNA. We gave that particular specimen its own voucher code. This here has a voucher code for the caterpillar it came from. So there's two records, one for the fly and one for the caterpillar. And then we asked the question, all right, how similar are these barcodes that we've gotten from all of these 16 generalists? Well, this is what it actually looks like. The black ones are something that had a name. So Monty gave this a name right here. And it turned out to feed on many different kinds of things. So that is a generalist. This one right here was given a name, an oxynox auratus. Turns out to feed on each one of these is a different species of fly feeding on the same groups on, on each one on its own species of caterpillar. So this turned out not to be one thing, one generalist feeding on many, but rather one, two, three, four, five, six, seven species, each one feeding on a different set of caterpillars. So the bottom line in all of this was that 16 generalist species turned into 73 species when you barcode them. So you can see what's happening. Oh, and but nine of them remain generalists. In other words, nine of the 16 were, in fact, generalists. They really do eat many different things. Interestingly, a thing about the generalist is this. The generalists can eat many things, but they're very rare. Well, that doesn't make sense. If you can eat many things, why aren't you out there very common? Because any caterpillar you find, you can lay an egg in. What we kind of decided in a very anthropomorphic sense is the generalists are very stupid. In other words, they're not very good at finding a caterpillar. So they end up taking whatever they can get. The specialists are very good at finding their particular species of caterpillar, but nobody else. So they're good at getting a lot of individuals of their particular species. So from their standpoint, they can be common for that caterpillar but they don't even exist for all the other caterpillars out there. Now, let me show you how this actually works in the real world. Um, this is a very common butterfly group here, the genus Obsiphanes. And um, Obsiphanes are um, uh, medium-sized butterflies, about the size of a monarch butterfly, a little smaller than a monarch butterfly. And you can see these are the males over here on the left-hand side. They're all very similar, as you, as you can see, by what they look like. But when you barcode them, they come in a nice group. So here's a group right here, um, which has um, uh, each one of these lines is one individual barcode. And the fact that they're all piled up here together on a single, on a single uh, line indicates that they are, um, uh, that they're all basically identical, all right? That's one species, Obsiphanes aloela, which is this one here. And then Obsiphanes tamarindi, which is this one right here. And that's its group there. And then Zelotes is this little group right here. And Cassini uh, is this big one, this, this one over here. And uh, Keteria is here. And there's one more down here at the very bottom. The point being that each of these species, which are pretty similar, but a, a shrewd uh, Lepidoptera, shrewd butterfly person would say, oh, yeah, I think those are different, uh, turn out to be, in fact, different. But you see, there's one big lump right here. Obsiphanes Cassini, but when you go down it, you see two things. One is that right here, there's a little branch. And you see there's a link right there. That says that these right here are probably about 
one base pair different from these here, maybe two base pairs, but very, very similar, but a little bit different. And the inclination is to say, oh, that's just a lab error. That's, you know, that's something that happened, a uh, little goof in reading the, reading the data. And then down here at the bottom, there's also a little, a little piece here where they're right in the same group, but they're off on a little side branch right here. So we looked at that little side branch right there. Didn't pay any attention to this one up here. Looked at this one down here and said, hmm, well, here's the mail that goes with it. Looks just like all the rest of them, and, you know, nothing special. But let's go ahead and like photograph of a bunch of these and these down here and compare them. When you do so, here it is here. This is easier what they've done here, but it looks like you notice that this orange bar comes up on the wing and then there's a gap between it and the orange band. And the gap is very thin line here and it's a broad space here. Hmm. So that looks just like variation, you know, like a gray horse is a little grayer and a gray or a little lighter in color. It's just still a horse for other sakes. Well, we didn't have many records here, but I put out a wanted poster to the paradoxonomist and said, I want you to go back to where these came from and get more caterpillars just from there. So now what we're saying is that the molecular data is guiding the field search. Well, here are what the females look like for all of these. And look at the females that go with this one. It's got a white band across the thing. Up right here. Now, this had never been noticed by the butterfly collectors. This place has been collected for 200 years by people who collect butterflies. Nobody had ever noticed this. Now, why did they never notice? See, they thought this was just variation. But they certainly would have noticed that white band. Well, here's the males. Again, these are the two males we were looking at. And you see, here's the new species right here. Um, look at the big gap right there. If you look at the, on these are the undersides. If you look at the underside, right here are two cells that are very dark. See, there's two of them right there. They're very, very dark inside, almost black inside. If you look at this one, they're not. The gray, bluish. That's the kind of little difference that one notices a consistent difference between one and the other. Now, I'm not saying that the barcode programs genetically for this colored spot. That will be a different gene. But this is the kind of thing that the people who are in the work with morphology want to notice and find the tail species apart. Now, let's go look at the female. So here's mom here, here's dad, I mean mom here for the common one, for Missy, with her white band. Wow, look how different she is. Well, on the underside, she's extremely similar, but she's also got a dark spot right there, which this one doesn't have right there. But still we have this question of why did the butterfly collectors never get this thing? Look at this. This is the common white banded species in the same habitat. This is our new one that we only noticed with barcodes. People have caught this one forever. So oh, that's the common one and turn it loose. So they don't collect it. So the museums are not full of, uh, there's a few of them, sure, but <coughs> it was never viewed as anything special. So what I'm pretty certain is that these have been caught, thought to be this and thrown away. That's mimicry. <coughs> and as mimicry does all, uh, derived directly from, uh, almost without doubt, this thing here being a mimic of that. Now, why that matters from a predation standpoint, I have the foggiest idea. I don't know why a predator would stay away from this thing and therefore stay away from this thing. We believe these are highly edible, but we don't know anything about their predation relationships. Look at how similar these moths are. 
if you saw that at the light at your back doorstep or in a gas station or just flying around somewhere, you'd say all of these are the same thing. Well, so have the butterfly collectors said these are all the same thing for 100 years. When we barcoded them, it turned out to be seven different things. So how do you find morphology that backs that up? How do you find morphology that says, hmm, this is probably really correct? Because remember that little barcode gene, that piece of CO1 is not programming for the color and pattern that you see here. That's other genes. So one of the other traits that tell these things apart. Well, male moths have got genitalia, which have very complicated forms. This is the male genitalia of this species. This is the male of that species. This is the male of that one, and so on. Look at the shape of this right here. See, it's turned inward with a sharp point on it. Here, it's a round thing like this. Here's some combination of the two, but Notice this comes down and goes, sweeps out in a pattern like this. This does, comes down, that goes to nothing. And furthermore, this piece in the center is very round. This is very pointed. So if you go down looking at each one of these, you begin to see that each one of these genitalia are different. That relates, of course, to how the males and the females mate with each other. And it's all part of the morphology that they will have genetic programs for, genomes for, being different. But in terms of what they want to look like, these are all, you know, these are all baits and mimics. These things are highly edible and look like very, very distasteful, uh, not edible things. So at the end of the day, you end up with classic information about the animal, butterfly itself, the caterpillars that go with it, the parasites it has, the remains of its pupae or larvae, and the data about what you, the data about the specimen itself, the dates, the places, what it was doing, what it was eating, and all of that, and the pupae as well, the photographs of the pupae, and you get millions of these records along with the barcode. So you have now two different ways of combining this information and beginning to work with it. And right now in that particular site, we have 500,000 of these things. So now we're talking about big data that can be manipulated and developed by, in a wide variety of ways to get to meet a wide number of people's agendas. This is basically the base for bioliteracy. This white bioalpha back here, bioalpha baptismal, the one I mentioned before. And where this is all part of giving a dictionary, giving a vocabulary to the whole population of Costa Rica. And where you are gonna fit into this, because obviously we're not talking about just Costa Rica here, we're talking about the world, is a day when you will have in your back pocket or your pants pocket or somewhere on you, something that's the equivalent of this comb, which costs basically nothing. Well, the hole in it, and you can take a piece of any living tissue or dead tissue for that matter and put it in a hole, it will barcode it. And it will send that barcode to a central repository by a wireless world, which we're already in, and send it back to your gadgets, whether it's your iPhone, it doesn't matter what it is, or your laptop or whatever, send it back and say, oh, this is such and such. Or it'll say, oh, uh, we've never seen that before. Where are you? You say, well, I'm in southern Nigeria, standing in the rainforest. I say, oh, would you take a photograph of it? So you go snap and you take a photograph of it. Now they've got a barcode, a locality, a photograph, and they can follow this or you can follow it either way to work out getting a name on it or figure out what else it does. Or you can, it can also send back to say to you, whoa, are you in Africa? And you say, yeah, yes. And they say, but, 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 but that organism shouldn't occur in Africa. I was just reading an article half an hour ago about an industry of exporting flying squirrels from Florida to Southeast Asia in large, large numbers as house pets. Those squirrels, those flying squirrels, which are native to Florida, Southeastern United States, 
will establish themselves almost for certain in Southeast Asia. So you'll have a new fauna, a new piece of fauna in that part of the world. It'll get eaten by predators, it'll get run over by cars, it'll be people's pets, it will carry rabies, it will bite children, and all kinds of things will happen. And one way of knowing which squirrel you're dealing with is by barcoding the tissues or barcoding the feces or the hair or the saliva or whatever it happens to be. So that's where it begins to fit with everybody. And pretty soon you've got 8 billion people on the same team. That's the only way I can think of a literacy, of course, is the same kind of thing. Now, how do we used to do this in the old days? Get names on things to know how to deal with them. Well, there's a box of um, parasitic wasps in, that have um, emerged from caterpillars in the ACG, um, just as is. Um, that we used to take once a year to England to go to the um, British National Museum, which had a huge, enormous, although well, I still does have a huge, enormous collection of insects from around the world and specialists who do the taxonomy of those insects. So we went over there once a year for routine identification of our things from Costa Rica. All right. And this is the world, this was the world um, authority for this group of wasps that, uh, that we were just looking at in this box, okay? And uh, he spent his entire life basically doing the taxonomy of these wasps. So we would go sit down with him and give him the box of wasps. And he would sit down and it would take him a day of looking at these specimens one by one by one by one at their detailed morphology and figure out what name should be put on them. So this time, just before I took these photographs, we took a leg off of each one of these wasps beforehand and sent that off to be barcoded. So that's why they have a yellow tag on them. You see they all have this yellow tag which said legs off for, for DNA. They're what they look like close up. So that, that's taking one leg off of here and sending that leg to Canada to be DNA barcoded. This is what's left of that box after I identify what I can do by barcodes and I don't know anything about these wasps. In other words, by looking at their barcodes and, collect, and collating that with their records that already exist in Google, on in, in databases in Canada, I could put names on almost all in that box, leaving just these to be species that he had never seen before, that there was no record of before him. So now this is where he puts his attention now, is in these undescribed species. Instead of wasting a whole day going through all those specimens, furthermore, instead of having me to do the politics of convincing him to spend a whole day on doing that, now I can do this by barcoding and he can do the important stuff with these remaining species which don't have names yet. This is the end of the day. This kind of DNA barcoding is coming along right at the time when society has produced a moderate number of people like Ian, who were specialists at whatever they were, birds, frogs, toads, snakes, beetles, wasps, it doesn't matter what they were. And they spent 40, 50, 60 years of their life becoming basically identification machines who, could, who really loved and really knew some particular group. They're all dying, they're all going, and society is not replacing them. This, the social structures, the university structures, the government structures, the, the sense of discovery and the sense of need that society has had in the past is not there anymore. The outcome is that the only way now and the next generations of people are going to be able to identify these things is by their molecules, is by their barcodes, not by having somebody like Ian who spent his whole life noticing little black dot on the underside of a wing. So now let's, we, we talked about where BioAlpha is, it's in Costa Rica. Um, and uh, let's take another look now here at what is conservation. 
in the beginning, conservation was the shaman's wild garden, the place in the forest where he knew the plants that he needed for drugs, for medicines, for hallucinogens, and basically nobody else went or fiddled in that spot. That's like going into your into your drug into your medicine cabinet and playing with all the bottles. All right. So that that's really where conserving a piece of the forest comes from in the first place. It's the shaman, the pieces that the shaman knew were very, very important for him. Now there were rules in conservation as well in the beginning. Um, one of the ones that I one of my favorites is that uh, the upper Orinoco River in South America among indigenous uh, Indian groups, um, they were not allowed to kill more than one taper per year per village by themselves as their rules, unless a neighboring village had killed one of them. And then they could kill two tapers. So this is the kind of thing that's a sort of a social conservation as opposed to a place conservation. Then of course, along comes the King's Hunting Preserve. We all know about this from the every 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 top level of, a, of the social pyramid has got their own private place, and um, the King's Hunting Preserve was certainly one of those. Yellowstone National Park, which many of you at least heard of, if you haven't been there, was established in the 1800s as a nice summer place for Washington D.C. politicians to go to to pass the summer hot muggy months in Washington, D.C. And the first railroad went directly to Yellowstone. And it was, the, the staff was the U.S. Army, keeping out everybody except the upper level politician. And I grew up around wildlife refuges as a place that were for protecting animals, birds, mammals, and so on. And that was my viewpoint as a child. And my father was a director of US Fish and Wildlife Service refuges. refuges. And um, that's all they were to me was a conservation. But in fact, what they were was a refuge for these animals, which were heavily hunted outside. So they had a place where they could go and be safe from hunting. And then when they wandered out or they flew out in migration, or after reproducing whatever they did, then they were available to be hunted. So now we suddenly have a thing which was conservation, but conservation to produce something for a lot of different individual people rather than for the king or the shaman. And now we finally get to this thing called tropical national parks, which is of course the basic seed for all this stuff I've been talking to you about for Costa Rica. And those are all basically colonial impositions on the tropics. Northern peoples who decided that for one reason or another, it would be valuable for them to set aside chunks of these tropical terrains with all these kind of exotic things in them and keep people out of them, keep people from harvesting wildly from them. And that's where we are, of course, today. And where we're headed in one sentence is that my feeling is that the guns and gold badges to keep people out in tropical national parks will never function in the long run. What has to happen is those parks have got to come to produce things, goods and services for the rest of the society that owns them. Now this is Costa Rica when I started doing things there. And uh, it's a map I made for an ecology course 20 years ago. And uh, the yellow is the agricultural countryside. The green is the national parks and other kinds of reserves that were basically preserved. Now, we've had about 100,000 years of figuring out how to manage the yellow. In other words, people have been developing the agricultural countryside for a long, very, very long time. In and we have many, many, many traditions and rules and methodologies for doing that. Well, good ones or bad ones, but we have very experienced in it. The green pieces we see here, we're not even in kindergarten. Basically what we've done is set them aside, put a fence around them and just set them aside, period. Now, Costa Rica in a peculiar circumstance has a very high return from that. We'll come to that in just a moment. If I put 
high school students or you up against a blackboard and say to me, okay, what do these green areas offer to a country? If you spent any time in Costa Rica, you would find yourself saying, well, they produce water. Because this is the ACG, the place we're talking about all the time here, where we're at our laboratory. Uh, these are the mountains. And these clouds right here are the um, uh, condensed water, which is condensing down and flowing in this river. And out of that river comes the water for irrigation of rice and pineapple and melons and pastures and all the other kinds of things. Basically, this conserved wildland is a water factory. That's what it does. And it generates water. That's a good. That's a good a light, a, a, or a service, if you like, but basically it's a good that comes from saving this. Because if you denude these hills, you take the forest off of them, they produce water in the rainy season like crazy, but in the dry season, they produce nothing. And so what happens is, um, this is, a, this is so a national park is a way of managing that wild area uh, to produce a good fine. So that's straightforward. This is the real payoff from those green areas. Now for Costa Rica, this is, I mean, this is only a third the size of the budget of the University of Pennsylvania, but the point is that three and a half million dollars a year comes from this crop. And um, this is foreign income, which comes from Costa Rica, basically because it's a green country. Now, there's a lot of complication behind that sentence, but basically because it is a friendly green country and has saved a very large chunk of itself in a wild state, but with the normal civilization of hotels and restaurants and, and highways and, and, and the society and so on to go with it, um, it generates three and a half million dollars a year. That is a crop. In other words, what is this a photograph of? It's a photograph of two Scandinavians willing to pay $500 a day each one to stand in the hot sun and take a picture of a termite nest. This book has brought more money to Costa Rica than any other publication ever published. And it's just a field guide made by an academic in the University of Costa Rica. This is meant to be a slogan, but it's also a very real expression about what's going on. Ecotourists are a better kind of cattle. They're not the only kind of cattle, but they're certainly a better kind. So basically, this word gardenification sort of crept into my vocabulary, and then I flipped it into Spanish as gardenificacion. And um, very interesting, it stayed that way for years and years and years until uh, a Costa Rican politician uh, at the time when I was. Uh, uh, on the stage to present these ideas to the president and the cabinet of Costa Rica, um, said to me, Dan, that, that's, that's a gringo word. You don't want that word. Um, and I sort of looked blankly at him and he says, no, it's a finca de la naturaleza. Now finca in Spanish means like a, a small ranch or a small garden, uh, a small, small farm. Um, and of course, nature, nature is here. So what he's saying is it's a, it's a, natural, it's a natural farm. Uh, and this is the Spanish way of dealing with it there. As I've emphasized already, we have had our entire society is full of the technology and the sociology of taking care of gardens. They produce for us, we protect them, we fertilize them, we plan them, we're careful where we walk in them, we fight over them. We do all these different things that society does. So if you can get a wild area, nature, to be viewed by society as a garden, you've already crossed a whole lot of the difficult boundaries. Because if society thinks of the garden as dangerous, I mean, the wild area as dangerous, a source of things that go bump in the night and that you need to worry about, then all of a sudden you've lost the battle. But if you have people thinking of it as a valuable piece of the wild area, but excuse me, a valuable piece of the society, then at that time, you've, got, you've gone a long, long way in real conservation. So now, to biodevelop the garden, this is like saying to biodevelop your garden behind your house, you have to, without damaging it, you have to know what is inside it. What are you gonna plant in it? How do you harvest from it? How, how carefully do you have to walk through it? 
what can each of the different kinds of things in your garden do and produce and what do they require? That is basically getting to know the biodiversity in the wild area. And as I think I've shown you before, but if I hadn't, I just remind you again, these are my students. Uh, basically, they're the paradoxonomists. They're real drawn directly from the working force, the agricultural working force in Costa Rica for a career in managing biodevelopment of a conserved wildland area. And this is one of them at work. And what he's got here in these bags, each one has got a caterpillar on it with a food plant to go with it. And he's been out there finding these kinds of things. Now, right here at this point, I have to note here that we had to start this thing as a non-government organization called the Guanacaste Dry Forest Conservation Fund. We couldn't have it be a branch of the garden of the government because these people don't have university degrees. And you have to have a university degree to be hired by the government. So when we started this, guess who our biggest enemy was? The universities of Costa Rica, who said, Dan, how dare you give these jobs to people who don't have university degrees? And by these jobs, they meant people who can drive cars, who can handle their own finances, who can learn all this biology that you are expected to learn here at the University of Pennsylvania. And to do these kinds of jobs of finding out what's in the conservation area and catalog it and work with the science community. So what do they really do? So here Ruth, when she's, oh, everybody in that photograph when it became this, when they were out of school and in the workforce. Okay? Half of them made it through sixth grade, another half or so made it through, um, through the high school. Uh, there's one PhD and a couple of uh, university degrees in that, in that group there. Ruth, who was a babysitter when she started doing this, 16 years old, noticed caterpillar turds on the dirt here of the road. She looks up here and sees the tree crown. So she knows the caterpillar's up there. So she goes and gets Memo, who was working as a tree planter. He brings a ladder, puts it up there. Ruth climbs up the ladder, finds the caterpillar. The caterpillar goes in a bag with the food plants. These food plants then come home with their bags by these people who are, as I say, these are working farm people and hung in a barn. So this is basically like raising chickens except that each chicken is in its own plastic bag. Each caterpillar is in its own plastic bag with its own food, which has to be changed every two or three days. So this is like taking care of a farm, except what you're doing is generating scientific information, which you then database on the spot. So these are pupae waiting to, to come out to produce adults. The, uh, the um, bags with the caterpillars in them are out in the sunlight so that the sunlight helps with photosynthesis and the green leaves in the bag. But here what happened is the data about this, this food plant and the caterpillar that was on it and the photographs that go with it all go into the laptop there in the field by them, not by a database manager hired from it with a university degree, not by a website manager, but by them. Why? Because what we said to the website manager was, no, we don't want you to do this stuff. We want you to teach the paradox on us how they can do this stuff. So they do their own databasing, their own management of their own information. And all I am is a, is a data checker, is quality control. They also hang lights in the forest like this. There's a car battery sitting on the ground behind this that's producing the, the um, uh, 12 volt batter, uh, juice to, to run these. Uh, it's a black light there and a white light there that mimics a star. And uh, it attracts moths to this white sheet hanging up in the forest. And uh, this is Hazel, who was a uh, wife of a um, school bus driver. And uh, uh, Sergio, who was a taxi driver on the Nicaraguan uh, Costa Rican border. And um, what they're doing is collecting individual moths into a plastic bag. So this is one goes in the little plastic bag and he's blowing one up over here to put another moth in. Um, and um, so they kept separate so they don't contaminate each other's DNA. These then they'll go back to the lab, are killed in a freezer, and then they're processed from there on by them. So here they are spreading these specimens, mounting these specimens 
which I, I like to think of as bookbinding, because this is like putting together a book in a preserved format that you can then store and read and use. So what they're doing is taking the moths that they collected from the lights, putting them out on spreading boards like this, putting them in an oven and drying them, and doing the same thing that a, people, a person with a PhD would be doing in the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC. And then finally, they're also not only doing the technology of this, but they're also explaining this to visitors. This is the um, scientific attache from China and his assistant over here on this side. This is the chairman of the department, uh, the, chair of the, the chairman of the Department of Biology of the University of Costa Rica, uh, who has finally come around to realizing that, whoa, in addition to our university students, we can have these kind of students too. They just work at a different level. And so what happens is then Ruth here, who was the one who climbed that ladder to get that caterpillar years beforehand, uh, is now explaining this whole process to people from, of course, the, the North from very different societies. Now, they do more than just do the biology, the management kind of stuff. This is a map of the area itself. The roads are in red that they work off of. The red spots are where those rearing barns are. Now, so it looks like, well, those are like little biological stations. And so they're all out there doing their biology in the forest there, but that's different from being park guards. That's different from being formal managers of a national park. Well, in fact, it's not because each one of those red things that turns yellow is actually done only by them. Now they don't carry guns and they don't have a gold badge, but if something goes wrong out in there, they call the government people and the government guy with a gun and a little badge comes and deals with the problem. Or if there's a fire, they join the fire crew and work with the fire. But the problem is that, and not the problem is, but the reality is we can take people who were trained initially to think of themselves as sort of mules in the countryside to being multi, multi-purpose people who live there, enjoy living there, their families there, and their Mother's buried over here, their father's buried over there. They're a part of that society and they can feel proud and, and competent at taking care of this wild area like they would take care of a garden for their own farm. Now this goes up to another level. This is the cabinet of Costa Rica. And um, this fellow right here, Carlos Manuel Rodriguez uh, is uh, explaining all of this that I'm telling you uh, to the president of Costa Rica, who's sitting right there. And uh, there's a screen off to my right here. And on that screen are the slides that you've just been looking at, uh, and, but uh, of course explained in Spanish, not in English, uh, to, to these people. And these are the effectively like the, the secretaries of, of our different departments in the, in the US government. Uh, they're called ministers instead of secretaries, but they're basically the same thing. There's the Minister of the Economy and the Minister of the Environment and the Minister of Commerce and the Minister of Foreign Relations and so on. So here's Carlos Manuel, who's the Minister of the Environment. And he's explaining this process to the President of Costa Rica as an integral part of Costa Rican society. And uh, as you can see, he's dressed like a Senator ought to be dressed, uh, like a minister, minister ought to be dressed in a suit and a tie and and very um, formal in his, uh, shall we say, uh, social behavior uh, with all of these people, uh, with his assistant sitting behind him here taking notes. And um, uh, the outcome of this is that uh, the president now is signing a decree that legitimizes BioAlpha right here on his little own, his, his own little uh, laptop screen uh, as a, uh, a, a national need. So now it's become something that's not just some esoteric thing that uh, biologists like to do out there in the forest with their butterfly nets, but rather as something that can be an integral part of Costa Rican economic sociology. The outcome of that and other things related to that is that he ends up on Time Magazine as the, uh, as the person of the year for environmental management. And um, uh, so this is the, 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 you notice we've gone from the guy working in the dirt and the rain uh, at the bottom of the pile here, all the way up to the president uh, in one continuous uh, stream or chain. This is very, very different from the traditions of science 
uh, in the um, uh, in the northern hemispheres where you go out on an expedition or a collecting trip, whatever it is, and you collect a bunch of stuff. You take it in and you deposit it in the Smithsonian Institution. It goes into boxes or cabinets or bottles or whatever it happens to be. It sits there for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 100 years, and along comes some other specialist who knows nothing about the collection process or the politics that went with it and does their part. They then publish that in the journal. It goes on the shelf in a library. Specimens go back on a shelf in the museum and it's forgotten for another 200 years. And the only way that information would ever even get out on the street and be used by other people is why somebody from the street goes and spends a lot of time in the library trying to notice what this information might be or how it might be useful. Instead, what we're trying to do is have the whole process move directly from the field into society as well as part of society being willing to take care of and tolerate the existence of that wild area. Now, what the guy was signing, what, uh, the, what the president Carlos Alvarado was signing here is this document. And here it says, uh, it, it declares BioAlpha to be of public interest. Now, Costa Rican jargon, that means that it's um, approved by the government as a policy, okay? Um, the second thing is that the information associated with it here, the, um, the sequenciación de código de barra means the, the, the um, the piece of the genome that's used for the barcoding can be internationally public domain, like words in a dictionary. It's the only tropical country in the world that has achieved that level of political understanding. Because of course, that little piece of the genome is part of the entire genome. And everybody realizes that the entire genome has all kinds of economic value. I don't need to talk to you about that. You're right now on a COVID. Think of what COVID would be like if you knew nothing about genetics. Okay. So we, the, the genomes themselves are viewed as natural patrimony. They're viewed as natural goods that um, need to be contracted, protected, uh, taken care of, developed, and all kinds of things. And that requires a whole another complex thing to do that. But knowing who the animal is, the plant is, the fungus is, the nematode is, the bacteria is, that's carrying this information, the tag, like your name, is not. That's public domain. Your name is a public word. Okay? You can find it in a dictionary. You can put it in Google, and there it is. What information is associated with your name is a whole other ballgame. But what's happened is, is that many, many, many politicians all over the world think that any piece of the genome is gold or platinum or oil or other kind of easily, trans easily transformed resource. So there's a, a great panic about not letting genetic information escape from Argentina or Colombia or Indonesia or Nigeria or Kenya. Costa Rica has reached the level of sophistication to realize that we need a vocabulary and need to be able to talk about things if you can talk about things, then you can work with them. And to talk about them, you need to have some way of knowing who they are. And for that, the barcode is excellent. So that's what, that's what, this is what Carlos Manuel was basically explaining to all these people. One of the outcomes for him now as a biopolitician is that just uh, what, on the, the 1st of September, just a few weeks ago, on the 1st of September, he, resigned from his job as the Minister of the Environment of Costa Rica and has taken over the CEO position of the Global Environmental Fund of the World Bank. So now he's in charge of a multi, multi-billion dollar operation for environments all over the world, and especially all over the developing world, the tropical world. He's the first time that the World Bank has been willing to entrust somebody from that world to be in charge of the Global Environmental Fund. And, it, and his springboard for getting there was the green country of Costa Rica. So that's his reward. It's not money in the bank. It's the opportunity to move up the ladder. Now, BioAlpha 
can't just talk about this stuff. It has to actually go out and do it. So this is a map of Costa Rica. And each one of these uh, dark areas here is a national park, just like you would think national parks in the United States. And each yellow star is where Biolfa now has a inventory process going and being run by the park, not by us. What we do is provide the barcoding, but now they handle putting the traps out, servicing the traps every Thursday or every Monday or every Wednesday, whatever the day is that they do it, being responsible for the samples, putting them in a the freezer, getting the labels on them, all that kind of stuff that the paradoxonomists are doing back up here in this, in our area or in my laboratory, if you like. And what they were doing now, so what happened is that we had a, a, a workshop, as they like to say, showing staff members from all these different parks how to do this stuff. And they went back home and they set these things up and they're running it. We now have a first full year of data, which has just gone to Canada for being barcoded uh, two weeks ago. So that's the process of getting it out into other people moving it away from the science community. These people who are doing this have no background whatsoever in science at all. And almost all of them would have maybe made it through high school. It's also being published in global, if you like, magazines. This is Monga Bay and it's a, a um, electronic uh, journal, basic or magazine it goes out to the whole conservation community, but mostly the South American and Central American one. And uh, it's describing this project. So now we're getting it into the sort of social media area of communication, as well as physically going out and doing these things. Um, but notice that the title that the science writer chose, the whole project hopes the DNA barcode every species in Costa Rica. Now, this is, this is an unfortunate error of mine. The big barrier to identifying all these things was not having a way to do it. When dark coding came along, that took us over the barrier of being able to identify all these different species. So me as a scientist, that was my big, wow, terrific, what a help. The general public couldn't care less about the mechanics of barcoding. It's just like you have no idea what the brain box in your car is doing. You want your car to do for you what you want it to do. You don't care what color the spark plugs are. You don't care what little wire is connected or what in the brain box. That's for specialists. So what you want to do is have a car that works. So what these people want is, is how, will, how will this influence me? How will this, how, how will this fix the pothole in the road in front of my house? I don't care about the whole highway system. I care about the road in front of my house. And we are arguing, as it says here, that public availability of the barcodes will revolutionize how Costa Rica values its biodiversity. That's that comb in your back pocket. That's the little hole in your iPhone. That's where we're headed. Okay. This is the kind of real world that this intersects with. This is a fifth grade class in the conservation area where this teacher sent me a photograph of this kid in the fifth grader here, holding the snake very calmly, showing it to the others, explaining why it's not venomous all day and kind of stuff. Now he was very proud of the student for being able to do this to show it to the other fifth graders. That's not what I saw in the photograph. What I saw in the photograph was one, two, three, four, five, and there's a sixth one somewhere iPhones taking photographs. That's an interview of a crop grown in the conserved wild area. And every time one of these kids takes a picture, there's 40 other people who see that photograph. That is the way communication is going to take place across the ordinary people of Costa Rica, the 5 million who have to care one way or the other. Now, though, that's a product. 
All right. that, that is a product from. Notice this slide says a crop interview, and this one says a client interview. Who are the clients for this? Are they the snake? Are they the kids? Are they middleman industry that manages the iPhones and, and the other related type of stuff? And who's the crop? Is this the crop? Are the kids the crop? Is this industry the crop? They're all tied up together and they're all doing something with each other. These kids 30 years from now be the ones that make a difference whether this forest they're standing in survives today or not. But now let's get more esoteric. This is the ACG, the conservation area here in the background. And this is a young orange plantation just being seeded in. Four years later, this is that orange plantation. Billions of oranges. Go through a juice machine. Produce juice and produce a rind. And out of the rind, we extract essential oils. And the essential oils are sold in your stores right here now as hand cleaners, biodegradable degreasers. That's worth more than the orange juice is. So what do you do if you have this many oranges? Now multiply that by a thousand trucks. For the orange peels after you've extracted the juice and the essential oils. We bet that I got 650,000 wild species, somebody is going to like to eat orange peels. That was my bet. This is a real, true, honest to God experiment and no idea what's gonna happen. So here is the first truckload dumped at a national park of orange peels. 100 truckloads of orange peels. This is when he's taking a photograph of them. Don't try this in your backyard, but the point is this was a 300 year old pasture degraded, nothing left of value whatsoever. And the question was, will my bugs eat it? That's what it looked like six months later. Horrible, like a toxic waste dump for some out of control industry. Six inch deep, tar, smelling like Cointreau. That's what it looked like 18 months later, not a trace. Insects ate all of it and the fungi that come with them. And this is the workforce. This particular fly right here. These are their larvae and three other species working with them. All came out of the forest, things that normally feed on fallen fruits in the forest and gobbled up our field. This is now being used all over the world. Guatemala, Africa, Spain, both to produce fly larvae in enormous quantities as chicken feed and as, um, uh, as protein feed for um, uh, aquatic uh, farming of fish and um, also for some biodegrading. So we said, all right, we'll do a deal with you. We'll take a thousand truckloads, same place. Here's us in the background in return for a big chunk of land of yours that has forest on it. Here's what it looked like six months later. Again, terrible, except that there were a lot of vertebrates and they're eating fly larvae as well. No, there's no towns here or anything like that. And these are not disease carriers or anything of that sort. Five years later, this is what it looks like. That old pasture is now a young thriving forest of natural regeneration by seeds coming in from wind, birds, bats, mice, small rodents, Big growth, big animals, all sorts of things get seeds get there. But the simple point is, you've got a forest going again on what was absolutely degraded and degradable land. We had 23 species of plants when we started to get 123 at this time, and they're still going up. Now, again, this is the Guardian and its article, again, counting the species how DNA barcoding is rewriting the book of life. This is what scientists care about, and that's fine. But we have to also have things that let the let ordinary people care about as well. Okay. Very interesting, the new environmental minister after Carlos Manuel left has put this thing onto um, on the web and said that, um, that this is exactly the thing that, uh, that they wanna see happening as part of 
Costa Rican political going forward. And finally, the same person, because of this and the green country she represents, has now been made this vice chair of the UN Environmental Assembly um, as, a, as a very recent thing that just, just now happened. And associated with this, Colombia hears about this at a meeting in Costa Rica and then a meeting in Norway and asks us to come to Colombia and explain it to their government and university audiences. So Winnie and I do, so we go and we do that. The outcome of going there and explaining was the 15 Colombians came to Costa Rica and had a one long, a week long x-ray version of all this stuff that I'm telling you about. Now, Colombia, as you know, is a very large country. Here's, here's, this is Costa Rica on Colombia here. The blue is Colombia. So we're talking about, you know, this is West Virginia for scale. So here we're talking about a, a, a U.S. state in turn, or a bigger one even. Um, you know, this is, I don't know if this is Texas or not, but it's, the point is, it's a big, a big chunk, a big chunk of terrain. We estimate Costa Rica has got a million species to play with. Colombia has at least five million species, but they got 63 million people, as opposed to Costa Rica only has five million. And the conservation area that all this is was sort of the seed for all of this is this little green spot that you see right up. Up there like that. Now the point is they came to the AZG and they spent a week in their own language talking to the AZG people and we in our clumsy Spanish about all this stuff and how it's worked and where the pitfalls are and what's worked and what has not worked. And um, they went home two days before COVID hit Costa Rica. And that stopped sort of everything. But the point being that even the everything back in Colombia, they've actually now started a pilot project in Colombia, mimicking these kind of things I'm talking to you about, but now for this very large country with a very large economy and a very large number of people. That's the kind of spread across the tropics that gets these ideas embedded in tropical societies. It doesn't work very well when you push down from the top, when the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, uh, IUCN, whatever it happens to be, pushes down from the top and says, thou must, thou must, thou must, and if you do it, we'll give you a big chunk of money. That works, the people will take the money and they will, will appear to be doing whatever it was that they were, that was being pushed on them from the North. But what we see over and over again, as soon as the money stops flowing, the desire to do it disappeared because it was being done as a way of getting the reward. What we see now is that if you go and you let this stuff spread like a virus at people level, from country to country, from government to government, from NGO to NGO uh, on its own, because it's logical, that has a much better chance of surviving and becoming part of an integral part of society for their own population. So I think what I have to do, I'm a couple of minutes early. Yeah, but well, I'll have to stop here because that was my last slide. And um, so we'll stop there. And um, uh, if we have uh, six minutes, if people want to ask me any, any questions on uh, the chat right at this moment, uh, I can do that if I can get back to the chat. I don't know how to do that. I'm not being successful in getting back to the chat thing. Uh, you can stop screen sharing. Let me uh, stop uh, share. Ah, yeah. there we go. Okay. Yes, there are five. There are five questions. Okay, let me see what they are. Yes. First off. Um, what Ozan Karatni said to everybody is that don't get lost in the details. Try to understand the big picture. And part of that is in the abstract. You want to look closely at the, the abstract at the beginning because, of course, the abstract was extracted by me to be readable in the classical elevator pitch. You know, the, you, 
you're talking to a politician, you maybe get one minute of his attention. And, um, and so he's got to get it, get the big picture from there. And he doesn't care about the little details. Well, and the thing I want to add maybe about that one particular thing is that as a scientist, I went into all of this thinking like I have to justify every single word and sentence that I say with data and with other people's data too. So I write a say a five page report. I take it to the minister. He puts it on his desk. He turns to the last page and reads the last two sentences and says yes or no. The title, he sees the title, what the topic is, but he turns to the back end, looks at the last two sentences and makes his mind up, yes or no. And I spent all that time into putting a complicated document together. Okay, now, um, Katie McCluskey said, why would evolutionary selection pressure choose more specialists rather than generalists? What we like to generally think is that their selection for specialists is that when food or whatever the resources that you're specialized on, let's take food here as the case, when that fluctuates in density, if you're specialized and very good at finding it, when it gets scarce, you still find it. So you stay in the game. Your population may fall, but you're still there. Whereas if you're clumsy or stupid, as we like to say as humans, if you're clumsy or not thinking ahead, whatever it is, and the food density goes down, you don't get it. And you die, you're gone. So we select for specialists over and over again because they're good at staying in the game when things get tough. Generalists are good at staying in the game when there's almost nothing left out there to eat, but they can eat something. It's the old, can you live off of shoe leather? You know, you're, you're starving and you don't have anything but the, the leather in your shoes. Can you live on that for a while? You're a real generalist. Okay. So it, as, as, Catherine, as Katie says, extreme niche partitioning. The way we as scientists describe this is niche partitioning detailed niche partitioning, meaning we only look for the particular thing that matters to us for specialists. Okay. All right, I guess we close down there then. Yeah, the chat screen is empty. Okay. See you all next time. <laughs>